Hello, this is your Mr. Security 702, and today I'm going to be talking about solubilities. And of course, as always, references in the dealing bob. Now, when most people think of the word solubility, they typically think of solubility in water. Because, well, that's usually what we talk about in the common context, because... What else are we going to talk about when we talk about the solubilities? But through the eyes of a chemist, uh, water is not the only solvent. Things can be soluble in water, and uh, things can also be soluble in non-water substances. Solubility is the ability of a substance to dissolve in another substance, which usually happens to be liquid. So, from that definition, which is the chemist definition, by the way, uh, we see that water isn't the only thing that can dissolve stuff. Every liquid can has the capacity to dissolve stuff. Uh, bleach, uh, laundry detergent, dish soap, uh, shampoo, conditioner, body wash, uh, dimethyl ether, diethyl ether, methyl ethyl ether. Say that one uh, five times fast. I dare you. Uh, gasoline stuff can dissolve in gasoline. Uh, think of any random liquid you can think of. And I am willing to bet that they, that liquid you think of can dissolve stuff. And if I contemplate it hard enough, I can tell you at least some of the stuff that can dissolve in that liquid. Uh, so there you have it. That's what solubility is, and everything can dissolve stuff. We as humans have a tendency to, if there's a long explanation, we usually make up a word with the definition as that long explanation. With that in mind, uh, we have these two up here. Uh, solute and solvent. Uh, solute is the substance that's being dissolved, and a solvent is stuff being uh, stuff doing the dissolving. Uh, those are just words that we made up to fit those defini uh, have those definitions. So uh, they have that. Uh, so with that in mind, solubility is a substance in a solvent makes sense, but put solvent here and put or no put solute here in solvent here. There you go. There are certain rules to solubility that have been uh, formulated from meticulous detailed analysis of few centuries worth of observation of solubilities. Uh, here I'm going to go into a general spiel about these rules of solubility. The very first rule of solubility is that the solute and the solvent c 
cannot chemically react. And this seems pretty obvious, but I'm a, I'm a chemistry tutor right now, and you, you would be surprised at how many of the uh, students I have, especially the pre-med students, say, how am I supposed to memorize that? Or uh, also I get, uh, if I don't tell the, this to them, I get the solvent and the solute are reacting. What's up with that? Uh, then they cannot be labeled solvent and solute because they're reacting. It's not a solubility problem. It is now a reaction problem. Uh, that's the two problems I get. How do I memorize it? Wrong definitions. It's weird. It really is. And I'm pretty sure there are going to be a few people watching this video who are going to be saying, Why are you going to be hating on the pre-meds? Pre-meds are going to be doctors someday. Why are you going to be hating on them? Uh, it's a simple truth that, uh, statistically speaking, pre-meds and medical school students are the most likely to learn exclusively through memorization, which is not a good way to learn. Uh, you need some memorization skills, of course. You got, if you're going to be a doctor, you're going to, you have to know about all the cells, the bones, the muscles, you gotta know the names of those. That's where memorization is applied. But when it comes to actual, like, illness, uh, you should also have the ability to consider what is physically going on in the biological system that is the human body. Uh, and you cannot do that if you learn only by memorization. You have to have some memorization skills and you have to have some uh, critical thinking skills. You have to learn through memorization for like the names and through critical uh, thinking uh, with everything else, pretty much. Any scientist and any good doctor will tell you that. And the way I see it, uh, I do not want a doctor who went through med medical school and did so only on this skill of memorization. Because if you memorize everything, you can't really critically think. And I do not want a doctor operating on me, medically or surgically or however, if they don't have any critical thinking skills. And all the pre-med students that I'm tutoring in chemistry right now, with one exception, have little or no critical thinking skills. All of their learning skills are purely memorization. That's why I'm hanging on pre-meds right now. Rule three. Polar solvents dissolve polar and ionic solutes. Now here, are, I guess I should define polar and ionic substances. So I'm going to do that. The second rule of solubility is, well, not really a rule, but like a definition kind of thing. Uh, the solute, by definition, has to be in lower quantities than the solvent. 
uh, let's say for example, uh, we're dissolving salt in water. Uh, salt would be the solute if there is less salt than water. And in that case, the water would be the solvent. Now, if it were the other way around and there were there was more salt than water, then water would be the solute and salt would be the solvent. That would be weird and I think physically impossible, but just an arbitrary example. Mm. Let's start with, uh, let's use two uh, substances that we are all very familiar with. Uh, water and salt, common table salt. Now, a polar substance is a substance that has a net uh, separation of charge within the molecule, but there is still, uh, but they are still neutrally charged. For water, it is a polar compound because uh, oxygen is much more electronegative than hydrogen, uh, which means the these uh, electrons here that are being shared are more attracted to the oxygen. Uh, because of that attraction, they are being pulled towards the oxygen. This causes a partial negative charge on the oxygen side of the water molecule. Uh, in this, because of this and the fact that water is neutral in charge, uh, there is also a partial positive charge here. And this positive charge is equal to in magnitude and opposite in charge as that negative charge there. So, partial positive plus Partial negative equals zero. That's all I'm trying to get at with that particular sentence. Uh, in this part, uh, separation in charge is what a polar substance is by definition. A polar substance is a substance whose molecular structure has this kind of separation of charge. That's the definition. So water is a polar substance. Now, as far as ionic substances, let's go to common table salt, NaCl. What's going on here is chlorine has seven electrons in its outer shell of elect uh, outer electron shell. Sodium has one in its outer shell of electrons. Since the sep uh, difference of electronegativity between these two is far greater than the difference of electronegativity between hydrogen and oxygen, what happens is chlorine plucks the lone electron off of the sodium and creates a sodium ion, which is an ion is a atom or compound with a net charge, so it creates a sodium ion 
and a chlorine ion. And from here, they take advantage of the fact that opposite charges attract. Sodium is positively charged, chlorine is negatively charged, so they attract each other electrically. It's more of an electrical attraction than it is a chemical attraction. Uh, but that's what ionic uh, compounds are. Uh, they are collections of ions, positively charged and negatively charged, that are attracted to each other electrically rather than chemically. These last, uh, these three are quite straightforward if you remember the definitions of solvent, solid, polar, and uh, ionic. Um, nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar solutes. Polar solvent cannot dissolve nonpolar solutes. And Nonpolar solvents cannot dissolve polar or ionic solvents. Pretty straightforward. Put gasoline into water, they don't mix. That's because gasoline is nonpolar and water is polar. That would be five. Water would be the solvent. Uh, and water cannot dissolve gasoline because the solvent is polar and the solute is nonpolar. Uh, if you try to mix uh, table salt with gasoline, it won't work because that would fall under six. Uh, gasoline is not nonpolar, salt is ionic, won't mix. Uh, the salt will be dirty if you try to filter it, but they won't actually mix. Uh, if you put uh, antifreeze in gasoline, it, they will mix because nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar solids, uh, solutes. They're both nonpolar. There you go. And as with three, you try to put sugar in water, they'll dissolve because sugar is polar and water is polar. Number seven, if there are two solutes with the same uh, ion in the same bucket, solubility of both solutes goes down. Here I should add that solubility is a quantitative value, which means it uh, has an, depends on a number, numerical values which are obtained through experimentation. And it's basically, you slowly pour a solute into a solvent and when it stops uh, mixing, that's the maximum range. Uh, I'm gonna do a couple examples to show this point right here. Uh, let us take, for instance, sodium chloride in water. Uh, its solubility, as tabulated, and you can find the numbers just about anywhere, is uh, 359 grams per liter of water. Now as far as sodium hydroxide in water, the solubility 
is 110 grams per liter. Uh, that's if there's uh, sodium chloride value depends on if there's only sodium chloride and water in the bucket. The sodium hydroxide in water, that's the solubility that depends on if there is only sodium hydroxide and water in the bucket. Now if we grab a bigger bucket and take the two smaller ones, the one that has NaCl, the other one has NaOH, dump them in to the bigger bucket. Uh, both of these have the same ion, sodium, which, which means, since they're in the same bucket, both of these values would go down. That's what this, uh, that's what number seven is trying to get at. Two solutes with the same ion, solubility goes down. That's the key thing there. Solubility goes down as temperature goes up. Now this is pretty counterintuitive, but it is an observed phenomenon. Uh, like for instance, we have calcium hydroxide in water. Top row is at 20 degrees Celsius, bottom row 100 degrees Celsius. But it, there's still both calcium hydroxide in water. Different temperatures. The lower temperature is 165 grams per liter. The higher temperature is 0 0.71 grams per liter. Uh, the common explanation for this is uh, the sol the solvent is closer to gas phase and therefore less able to hold on to any solute. So there you have it. Of course. I will be inputting all of the uh, references in the dealing with Bob. I did not have time to put references in the video. Uh, too lengthy, too broad of a topic. Um, but they will be in the dealing with Bob in case you're interested in it. Well, on that note, this is your Mr. Security 702 signing out.